All right. I'd like to first discuss the Illinois financial problems, you know, with the state going bankrupt. You've been reporting on this. So can you maybe give us some insights on the problems that Illinois is facing and also your perspective on it? Yeah, well, I think they definitely are going bankrupt. And here's how it started. Basically, let's go back maybe 20 years. Um, Government officials and public sector union officials sat down and effectively bought labor peace with not so much raises in the moment, but increasing pension promises. And they ended up promising their cops and their teachers and their firefighters, you know, people, good people who aren't ripping anybody off and and who are um, doing their work and deserve to be reported, rewarded for it. Um, they, they, They gave those guys really insanely generous pension benefits that could never, ever be paid off. And now it's starting to bite because the baby boomer public sector workers are retiring and these balance sheet issues, you know, you it used to be just an accounting issue that you had these unfunded liabilities in your pension plan and, and um, someday that was going to have to be dealt with, but we'll do it later. Well, later is now, you know, the, the unfunded liability is turning into an actual cash flow issue for Chicago and Illinois and for a lot of other cities and states out there. But but Illinois is really the epicenter of the problem right now. Uh, They can't maintain their pension payouts to their retired public sector workers and run a functioning state at the same time because there's just not enough money to do it. Uh, But they're legally not allowed to cut pension benefits because those benefits are enshrined in the Illinois constitution. <laughs> so they're, they're really stuck. And the only solution they've been able to come up with, well, they've come up with two over the years. One is to borrow money and pay their pension benefits that way, which just digs them more deeply into a hole. And the other is to raise taxes to try to get some money in. But that is causing an exodus of people from Illinois. You know, it's losing more, more people than any other state because taxes are ridiculously high and public services are still being starved by pension payouts. So life is getting harder in Illinois on on so many different levels that it's leading people and businesses just to bail, Uh, which means they're in a death spiral now where the, the most recent extreme tax increase that they're at least thinking about passing might delay their um, descent into junk bond status, but it won't prevent it. And in fact, it'll it'll make the eventual descent a lot steeper when it happens because they're they're hurting themselves by raising taxes at this point. So there's no real way out short of some kind of bankruptcy, and that it might be coming pretty soon. I mean, let them be lowered to junk bond status by the big rating agencies, and then their interest costs go up. And since they're still borrowing tons of money in order to fund the operation of the state, uh, the cost of that new money coming in is going to be much, much higher than it has been in the past, which will make it that much harder for them and and that much less likely that they'll be able to pay their bills and that much more likely that they'll be downgraded further into junk. And, you know, once that starts, it's impossible to get out of short of bankruptcy. So they're going to fail at some point and default on their debt in some way. You know, it's not clear how a state goes bankrupt in the US. We're gonna find out uh, what happens when a big state defaults, but it's not clear exactly what the legal mechanisms for for that are. Uh, Illinois is gonna blaze that trail. And then the question becomes, uh, what do the markets do when a big state in the US defaults? I, I suspect that people with money at risk are going to start looking around going, who's next, you know, and and they're going to find a lot of potential candidates because we have four or five other states that are in almost as bad a shape financially as Illinois is. And we have dozens of cities in the U.S. that are bankruptcy candidates going forward for the same reason, Um, outrageous pension benefits that can never be paid back, but then can't be cut for political reasons. Um, Then... They're going to start looking around to places like Europe and Asia and find a lot more, you know, Illinois type situations. there. failed states. Italy is one. Uh, Portugal is potentially another. Greek, Greece is certainly one. Um, a lot of the um, emerging 
Asian countries are borrowing an awful lot of money. A lot of Latin American com- countries are borrowing a lot of money in dollars, which means that if the dollar goes up, they're they're kind of screwed. So once the markets get into their heads that um, a financial disaster is possible in a localized situation, you know that they're they're not going to be bailed out by the governments of the world. Um, and that, that means that lots more can happen in the short run, then the markets are going to get very spooked. Now, the alternative scenario is that um, the U.S. steps in and bails out Illinois or whatever else blows up in the meantime. And that shifts the focus from the specific entity that's blowing up to the currency that's being used to bail them out. Uh, that That happened in Europe, basically, where... The European Central Bank is taking on the debts of all of these failed European states that can't function in a monetary regime that suits Germany. You know, Italy and Greece, just they they can't do it. Um, And their banks are failing. And the European Central Bank, in various ways, is having to bail out those banks, which is basically saying that European taxpayers are taking on the obligation of keeping Italy solvent in a relatively strong currency regime, uh, which means maybe the euro is not the rock solid currency that we thought it was, you know, and and the same thing is going to happen in the US. If if the federal government starts bailing out bankrupt states, then what does that say about the dollar? It's possible that that becomes the straw that breaks the camel's back in the fiat currency world. And we finally figure out that it really is the explicit policy of all these major governments to lower the value of their currency year after year after year at an accelerating rate because they're taking on so much debt that there's no choice but to devalue really aggressively to get out from under that debt if you want to avoid a 1930s style depression. Uh, When the markets figure that out, it makes no logical sense to hold on to these currencies to to any greater extent than is absolutely necessary. And you get what the Austrian School of Economics calls a crack up boom, where everybody, as soon as they get paid or, or receive cash for whatever reason, immediately convert that cash into real stuff because they don't trust the value of the cash going forward. And that causes the prices of things to spike, which, you know, that manifests as inflation. But really what it is is a loss of faith in the currency. And then the currency just collapses. It just evaporates because once something like that gets started, once trust is lost, then a fiat currency really, in in effect, ceases to exist. Because all it is is this make-believe thing that exists because we trust the people managing it. You know, if we trust the central bank of the U.S. to maintain the value of the dollar, then the dollar has value. Uh, If we don't trust the central bank, then the dollar has no value. It's not a real thing like a a gold coin which exists independent of the promises of the financial sector or the, the government. And so once you start worrying about counterparty risk at the the state level, then all bets are off. And we really are headed for something like that. And some a place like Illinois could be the catalyst for that death spiral of all the fiat currencies all at once, you know, and, and it's coming. We'll get that test in the next year or two, probably. But of course, there are lots of other things that could go wrong in the meantime. We have lots of failed states and uh, insolvent banks and other company, you know, other companies and stock markets and things like that that, that are all at risk one way or another, and any one of them could start this ball rolling. This is really interesting how you're saying that, you know, the U.S. government and other governments around the world have to devalue their currency just basically because they're in so much debt and keep going into debt more and more that in order to not have this spiral out of control, they have to make their currencies worth less so that their debt is devalued as well. And it kind of is interesting how we see this, you know, small situation in Illinois. I mean, it's a pretty big situation. Illinois is the fifth largest state by population, but we're seeing this, you know, how Illinois might be going bankrupt. It might be the first state that gets its debt downgraded to junk status. 
But it seems like it's not just Illinois that's in this situation. It's not just other states that are in this situation. It seems like it's the entire country and pretty much a lot of different countries around the world that are in very similar situations. Yeah, it's it's virtually the whole world. All the developed world countries have been borrowing too much money at every level of their society, really since the 1980s, which can be traced back to the 1971 decision by Richard Nixon to take the US dollar off the last vestige of the gold standard, which in effect handed all of the world's governments an unlimited credit card. They could create as much new currency as they wanted to and then just toss it out there to finance their, you know, the incumbent politician's reelection or the next war or whatever social programs they think are um, are absolutely crucial to running a humane society. You know, whatever their rationale is, they can finance it. And so the governments of the world haven't had to prioritize. They've been able to basically do all the stuff they want. You know, in the US, we have a trillion dollar a year global military empire and a more than a trillion dollar a year um, comprehensive entitlement system. Now, most countries wouldn't be able to afford that. And we wouldn't be able to afford that if we actually had to pay our own way. But instead, we can just make it up out of thin air. We just create currency with a mouse click now. And that's how we pay for all this stuff. But it creates debt in the process that at some point in the future has to be paid off or monetized away. In other words, you, you can, and a lot of economists are lobbying for this now, um, you can have the central banks of the world just buy up all the debt and then retire it. And then boom, the debt is gone. You know, And that sounds like a free lunch to people who don't, don't completely get how money works, I think. But in, you know, if you've created a bunch of currency in order to buy back this debt, then all that currency is still out there. And at some point, a soaring supply of currency leads to what we talked about before, the crack-up boom, where people lose faith in the currency and then it just falls apart. So that's the risk that we're taking by bailing everybody out, in effect. You know, when central banks buy up all the government debt that they can find out there. In effect, they're bailing out the government. Uh, and we've been doing that to a greater and greater extent for the past 30 or 40 years. And we've reached the point now where really at every level of every society, there's too much debt. You know, U.S. consumers and, and to an extent European and Asian consumers have way more personal debt in terms of mortgages and credit cards and car loans, et cetera, et cetera, student loans than we ought to. You know, for to lead a healthy financial life, governments are at record levels of debt now and and increasing at an accelerating rate. Corporations in the U.S. hit record levels of debt in the past year in order to buy back their own stock. So wherever you look, there's too much debt. And once that debt starts to bite, I mean, it is biting in the sense now that it's hard to grow at historically normal rates if you're um, an over indebted economy. And so we're seeing slower growth than you would normally expect with super low interest rates and aggressive government deficit spending. And economists are kind of baffled by this in a lot of cases, but they shouldn't be. It's just common sense. You know, if you borrow too much money, it's hard to do stuff going forward that you used to do because you've already borrowed all the money that you can borrow or you uh, – you can't do anything productive with new borrowing because you've already done all the logical stuff with the money that you borrowed in the past, you know, and that that's why um, a stat called marginal productivity of debt is plunging. You know, it used to be that in the U.S., for instance, we could um, borrow a dollar and invest it productively and get a dollar of GDP growth out of it. That's how it worked in the 1960s. You know, debt was almost uh, one for one productive in terms of new wealth creation capability. And now it's like six or seven where we got to borrow six or seven dollars in order to get a dollar of GDP growth. Uh, and it's rapidly heading towards zero. Now, when when it hits zero, when you can borrow all the money that you want to and you don't get any new wealth creation out of it, um, that's kind of the end of the road for this financial strategy that we're pursuing. And based on most trends, that 
had any kind of historical significance in the past um, or predictive significance in the past. Um, we're, we're getting pretty close to that point where there's really not much else we can do with the current set of policy tools that allow us to get through the, the next election campaign or the next corporate reporting period. You know, we're just running out of stuff to do, uh, which means we either have to bite the bullet and then go back to some kind of a, um, a, a sustainable system where we don't borrow so much money all the time and we live within our means, which is going to be politically incredibly painful, or we go to the next stage of the monetary experiment which is to basically adopt uh, you know, what, what is called modern monetary theory, in which you dispense with the whole government issuing bonds in order to finance itself thing and just have the central bank create as much new currency as the government needs to run itself. Uh, now, we're, we're pretty close to that now with central banks buying up most of the bonds created by government. So in effect, we're just monetizing the government going forward. But once that becomes explicit, which it kind of has to at some point, because otherwise the markets will uh, will stop trusting the process, then what that means is that we're relying on the government to know when it's had enough and to exercise self-control, which is absolutely impossible. You can't expect elected officials to exercise control over their spending if they don't have to, because there, there are infinite needs out there from a political standpoint. I mean, once you say, OK, we're going to run the government in a way that satisfy, satisfies everybody's needs, then all of a sudden everybody's needs exponentially increase, right? Everybody's hand is out for tax cuts or, you know, the invasion of this country that threatens us or unlimited health care or unlimited housing. You know, it goes on and on. You get kind of a Bernie Sanders um, world where college is going to be free and health care is going to be free and housing is going to be free, uh, all paid for with newly created currency that's just been conjured up out of thin air. And obviously, you reach a point in that process when nobody trusts that currency anymore because it's being created on such a vast scale. So we're headed for that one way or another. We're headed for something like that. And whether it's this year or five years from now is really the big question because the trajectory is pretty clear, but the wall that we're going to hit is is not visible right now. You know, we don't know where it is. It's it's a barrier out there. We're going to slam into it and this game is going to end, but we can't see the wall until we hit it. So it, it's not clear how you play this from an investor standpoint other than to, you know, start shifting to real assets, you know, buy the stuff that people are going to buy during the um, the crack up boom. And then you know you'll be well positioned when it happens. And that's gold and silver and farmland and other really, really well chosen pieces of real estate, not San Francisco condos or New York City penthouses or something that have already quintupled in the last 15 years, but uh, you know, a college town rental house or something like that. that. That's the kind of real estate that will tend to hold value going forward. Uh, there are a few other things that traditionally do well in times of currency crisis. And you want to just educate yourself about the process and then shift your finances into those things. Um, the, the problem with that is that you might not make any money for five years while stocks continue to go up and you feel like an idiot. Or it all might blow up before you get done and, and at least you did something. You know, you just can't know when this happens. Um, so with timing being the issue instead of the eventual outcome, that's at least, you know, kind of this, it gives you an ideal to strive for. You know, someday you want to have a portfolio that's all real stuff and um, with, with minimal financial exposure to government bonds and cash. Um, so you want to start working towards that and then just hope you get it done at exactly the right time. Now, you were talking about how rates are artificially low right now. As you know, the Federal Reserve continues to raise interest rates and we see more interest rate normalization, you've talked about how really markets are unprepared for this and we're going to see a lot of volatility ahead. Could you expand on this? Well, yeah, there's a growing chorus among central bankers and government officials and, and big investors that we need to quote unquote normalize interest rates. In other words, um, declare victory. 
in the um, negative interest rate, zero interest rate, quantitative easing kind of uh, experiment that we've been pursuing and move back to historically normal rates, which would be like a, you know, a 6% annual or average rate for treasury bonds and a three or four or five percent rate for short term rates in the US and Europe and Japan. Um, but it's not clear that we can do that mathematically. <laughs> because if you um, raise interest rates across the board, that means all the new government debt that's being taken on and, and all the government debt that's being rolled over is being rolled over at higher interest rates. And that will explode the budgets of most of the major governments. And it will also change the calculus between stocks and bonds. You know, stocks are up in large part today because interest rates are extremely low. So it makes stocks look relatively attractive. But you raise interest rates to normal levels and stocks might go ha have to go back to historically normal levels, which is way lower than this in terms of price earnings ratios and price to book and et cetera, et cetera. Um, so you get extreme volatility in the markets if we try to do something like this. Uh, and it's, it's possible that we'll try. Only the Fed right now is actually trying. You've got a lot of people um, advising, for instance, the European Central Bank to, um, to start interest rate normalization, but they haven't begun yet. Uh, but were the Fed to try and actually carry it through, you know, actually raise rates a few more times and for long term interest rates in the US to go up because the Fed is selling bonds out of its um, huge bond portfolio, then you would see extreme volatility come back to the markets. Um, interestingly, if they don't do that, we'll see extreme volatility as the, uh, you know, the, the amount of debt just gets bigger and bigger and bigger at these extremely low interest rates and, until we reach some kind of a crisis point because of excessive debt. So there's no way out of this without extreme volatility. But interest rate normalization might be the source of the, the next wave of uh, market fun and games that we're going to see going forward. So, you know, you know, it's completely possible we have another 2008, 2009 kind of episode where a lot of bubbles start bursting at once, beginning with maybe Illinois, beginning with maybe the stock markets of the world or the bond markets of the world because of interest rate normalization, you know, beginning with any number of other things that could happen. And, and that leads to this time of extreme placidity that we're seeing right now, uh, where the VIX, the, the measure of volatility in the stock market is at record lows, uh, we'll see that morph into its opposite, where everything starts bouncing around and you see volatility measures just go through the roof and everybody gets terrified. Um, we're, we're wildly overdue for something like that, just based on historical market cycles. And you've got all these imbalances building up that could lead to one thing or another happening. So I, I think that uh, it's also a safe bet <laughs> that uh, in the next couple of years, volatility will be a lot higher than it has been in the last couple. Now, I'd like to shift gears here a little bit. I'd like to discuss the recent price action in the precious metal markets. Now, we were talking before the interview about how you've been saying that we could be close to a bottom for gold and silver because all the speculators have been flushed out. Can you talk a little bit about this? Yeah, there's this thing called the Commitment of Traders Report, which tracks what the, um, the various players in the futures contract market are doing with gold and silver. Um, and historically, it's been a pretty good indicator of uh, the, the general trend going forward for metals prices, because it tracks what, uh, what the speculators and what the fabricators are doing. Those are Two people who are on the opposite sides of the trade usually, um, or the commercials, not just the fabricators. The commercials includes big banks that uh, tend to manipulate these markets. But anyhow, to, to simplify the, um, the story, when the speculators are really excited and really long, that's a sign that the markets are heading down because <laughs> speculators trade on emotion and momentum. And when they reach an extreme of optimism, that means that uh, that that trend has probably played out and vice versa. You know, when when speculators are really pessimistic, that's usually a sign of a bottom in gold and silver. And uh, they, they were extremely optimistic 
three or four months ago. Gold and silver has gotten whacked since then, and that's flushed a lot of the speculators out of the long side and into the short side. So we're reaching the point where historically uh, we've seen a bottom in gold and silver because the speculators have become very pessimistic. So it's possible that it's already happened. It's possible that we need another couple of down weeks in gold and silver. But the end of the downtrend is either here or pretty close based on this indicator. Meanwhile, you've got seasonal factors working in gold and silver's favor starting at the end of this month. Um, the demand usually picks up around the world in various gold buying markets in August and then continues to be pretty strong through February. So this is the time that um, just based on seasonal indicators when you would normally want to be a buyer of gold and silver. So, so you've got these two fairly reliable indicators of trends in metals prices coinciding right now in a positive way. Uh, so we should check back in another few months, Elijah, and see if it turns out to be true. But I think there, there's a pretty good bet based on history that uh, the next few months – will be as good for gold and silver as the last few months have been depressing. All right. Well, John Urbino, thank you so much for joining us today.